Danny Green was an Irish-American organized crime figure who gained power in the local chapter of the International Longshoremen's Association and later became a full-time crime boss. He began competing with Jewish-American organized crime figure Shonda Burns and the Italian-American Cleveland crime family for control of the city's criminal underworld. Green allied himself with labor union leader John Nardi, and after the humiliating failure of multiple attempts of his life, Green would repeatedly taunt the Lick Ovalee faction as maggots in the Cleveland news media. This would eventually catch up with him and ultimately lead to his demise. Welcome back. Before we get started, be sure to subscribe to the Past Crimes channel and leave a comment below to let us know what other past crimes you would like to hear about. Danny Green was born, Daniel John Patrick, on November 14, 1933, in Cleveland, Ohio, to John Henry Green and Irene Cecilia Green. His father was also born in Cleveland, but his mother was born in Pennsylvania. Green's mother died three days after his birth, and he was called Baby Green up until his mother was buried, and then named after his grandfather, Daniel John Green. Danny's father drank heavily and eventually lost his job as a salesman, after which he temporarily moved in with his grandfather. Unable to provide for Danny, his father placed him in Parmadale, a Roman Catholic orphanage in Parma, Ohio, three miles outside Cleveland. At the age of six, Danny's father began dating a nurse and then married her. They started their own family and brought Danny to live with them, but Danny resented his stepmother and ran away on several occasions. He then moved in with his paternal grandfather and an aunt for the rest of his childhood in the Collinwood neighborhood. Danny attended St. Jerome Catholic School, where he served as an altar boy and developed a fondness for the nuns and priests. He also formed long-term relationships with a few of his teachers. He was athletic, a baseball phenom, and an all-star basketball player. The nuns at St. Jerome allowed Danny to participate in sports despite being a poor student because they saw his value to the team. Danny went to St. Ignatius High School where he frequently clashed with Italian-American students, children of more recent immigrants struggling for a place and subsequently formed a lifelong hatred for Italians. He transferred to Collinwood High School after being expelled from St. Ignatius and excelled there in sports. Prior to being expelled from his troop and eventually Collinwood High School, he was also a Boy Scout for a brief period of time. Green joined the United States Marine Corps in 1951 after being expelled from Collinwood High School. There, he quickly gained attention for his skills as a boxer and marksman. He spent some time stationed at Marine Corps Base Camp Lejeune in Jacksonville, North Carolina, and was frequently transferred, perhaps as a result of behavioral problems. Green taught new junior Marines in the use of the artillery after being promoted to corporal in 1953. Later that year, he allegedly received an honorable discharge. Green consistently worked as a longshoreman at the Cleveland docks in the early 1960s, long before the International Longshoremen's Association, or ILA, organized the industry. He spent his free time reading about Ireland's turbulent past and developed the idea that he was a Celtic warrior. It is believed that his desire to commit crime was motivated by reading about such warriors. The local union's president was fired by the ILA in 1961, and when the next election came around, Green easily won the position of interim president. While in office, he increased dues by 25% and required employees to put in volunteer hours to help with a building fund. Those who objected frequently lost their jobs. While referring to them as winos and bums to other employees, he fired more than 50 members. To pressure the stevedore companies into allowing the ILA to supervise the hiring of dock workers, Green oversaw sometimes violent protests and strikes. Many workers were required to temporarily unload grain from ships as a requirement for employment as longshoremen. They then turned over their paychecks to Green, who claimed the funds would be used to build a union hall, but in reality kept the money in his personal bank account. As a union organizer, Green occasionally called work stoppages, sometimes as many as 25 in a single day, to show business owners that he had control over the docks. 
Sam Marshall, an investigative journalist, gathered affidavits to support allegations of extortion, leading to Green's expulsion from the union and his conviction for embezzlement. Later, an appeal overturned the conviction. Green chose to admit guilt to the less serious charge of falsifying union records, pay a $10,000 fine, and receive a suspended sentence rather than go through with a second trial. He allegedly didn't pay the fine or serve any time in jail. After returning to his rackets, Green met and befriended Teamsters boss Louis Triscaro, who introduced Green to Jimmy Hoffa. After the friendly meeting, Hoffa later reportedly said to Triscaro, Stay away from that guy, there's something wrong with him. After starting its own investigation, the ILA swiftly removed Green from office. In the end, Green was found guilty in federal court on two counts of document falsification and the embezzlement of $11,500 in union funds. After an appeals court overturned the conviction, federal prosecutors and Green negotiated a plea deal in which Green admitted guilt in exchange for two misdemeanor charges and a $10,000 fine, though he only paid a portion of it. The Cleveland Solid Waste Trade Guild employed Green to maintain peace. Mobster Alex Shonder Burns hired him as an enforcer for his various numbers operators after being impressed by his skills. Additionally, Green and other Irish-American gangsters were employed by Frank Brancato, the underboss of the Cleveland Mafia family, in the 1960s as errand boys and muscle men to uphold the Mafia's control over garbage hauling contracts and other rackets. Big Mike Fratto left the Cleveland Solid Waste Trade Guild and established the more respectable industry organization known as the Cuyahoga County Refuse Haulers Association. Arthur Snipperger was given the task of planting a bomb on Fratto's car by Green in September 1970. It was claimed that Snipperger was killed by the bomb and Fratto, who was standing across the street, was spared because the bomb detonated prematurely. Many believe that Green murdered Snepperger after finding out he was an informant. An underworld source informed Sergeant Edward Kovacic that Green had activated the detonator, instantly killing Snepperger. Officially, the case was never resolved. Fratto was shot and killed on November 26, 1971, at Cleveland's White City Beach. Green was detained and questioned and admitted to the murder, but claimed self-defense. He said that while he was jogging and exercising his dogs, Fratto fired three shots and he returned fire with one shot. Green was released after it appeared that the evidence corroborated his account. Shortly after that, Green was a target once more in White City Beach. Several hundred feet away, a sniper who was hidden fired several rifle shots at Green. Green ran in the direction of his would-be assassin while pulling out his revolver and started firing. The sniper ran away without being positively identified. Investigators learned that this attempt was part of a murder contract left by Burns. Green was the so-called Robin Hood of Collinwood, as depicted in the movie Kill the Irishman, where he often picked up restaurant tabs for friends, neighbors, and acquaintances, and left generous tips. He also had 50 20-pound turkeys delivered to needy households on Thanksgiving. Green formed his own crew of young Irish-American gangsters, called the Celtic Club, and also allied with John Nardi, a Cleveland crime family labor racketeer who wanted to overthrow the leadership. Burns and Green's friendship started to deteriorate. To establish a cheat spot, Green had requested a $75,000 loan from Burns. The money was lost in the hands of Burns' courier Billy Cox, who used it to buy cocaine, despite Burns' arrangements for it through the Gambino crime family. The drugs, the remaining $75,000, and Cox were all taken by the police after they conducted a raid. The Gambino family demanded their money, and Burns pressed Green, but he refused, reminding Burns that he could not return something he had never received and that Burns was accountable for it because Burns's courier had misplaced it. To settle matters, Burns directed an associate to hire a hitman for Green and gave him $25,000 for the job. Several minor underworld characters took the contract, but their numerous assassination attempts on Green failed. Green was the target of a bomb assassination attempt, so he chose to strike back. 
Burns was killed by a bomb containing the powerful military explosive C-4 on March 29, 1975, in the parking lot behind Christie's Lounge, formerly Jack and Jill West Lounge, a go-go bar located at 2516 Detroit Avenue, close to St. Malachi's Church. Collinwood was shaken on May 12, 1975, by another explosion. Green suffered only minor wounds despite his building at 15805, Waterloo Road being completely destroyed. He was protected from the debris by a refrigerator that had become stuck against the wall as the second floor collapsed. Green, who wore St. Jude's medal around his neck at all times, attributed the failure of a second, more potent bomb to the intercession of the saint. Longtime mob boss John Scalish passed away in 1976, leaving the lucrative criminal enterprises in Cleveland, particularly the Teamsters Union locals, up for grabs. James Lickovely, whom Scalish had named as his successor, was challenged for control of the organization by John Nardi and other mobsters. Within weeks, and with Green's assistance, Nardi had many of Lickovely's supporters killed. It's likely that this marked the start of a protracted conflict between Green's Celtic Club and Lickovely's Cleveland crime family. The Cleveland area experienced 36 bomb explosions in 1976 alone, earning the nickname Bomb City, USA. Green played up the rumors of the Mafia's botched assassination attempts after the Waterloo Road bombing failed to kill him. His bluster and flamboyant behavior only fueled the urban legends of the Cleveland criminal underworld that portrayed him as invincible and powerful. Green granted interviews to local television stations and during a televised interview said to one television reporter, You see this trailer behind me? It's where I work. See the bar at the end of the street there? Get a shot of that. I live on the top floor. Let me tell you something. If any of these maggots from the so-called mafia want to come after me, I'm not a hard man to find. On May 17, 1977, Green's longtime ally John Nardi was killed by a bomb. On October 6, 1977, Green visited the Brainerd Place office complex in Lyndhurst, Ohio, for a dental appointment. His phone had been tapped, and the Mafia was aware of the appointment. Green visited a dentist, then walked out of the building and toured his car. The car that was parked next to him blew up, instantly killing Green. 